Hi, I'm Lushni, I'm a product specialist of Hacker Neuron Pro, and today I am here with the Vice President of Complex Injury Rehab, Heather Candelo, and Occupational Therapist, Ayushi Dingra. Good morning to both of you. Good morning. Good morning. So, mm-hmm. Heather, I know that we met at ABI in New Orleans, um, and this was just before everything had changed. Um, <laughs> I would love to have you talk about your practice and the kinds of that you work with and your treatment philosophy. Um, and I usually do the same thing for you too. Sure. So yeah, we are a team of predominantly occupational therapists and uh, all very passionate about working with neuro rehab population. Uh, we are in the greater Toronto area in Ontario, Canada. Um, and I think we, so myself and Tracy Milner started our practice, uh, basically because we were feeling like we couldn't quite find a place to work that had the philosophy and the approach that we wanted to take to working with our clients in the community. Uh, so we decided to just try and figure out how to do it on our own. Um, and I think really our approach has always been grounded in the real core values of occupational therapy and, you know, looking at the the whole person. Um, often in the neuro rehab population, they've come out of a, a hospital um, where there's very specific goals focused on discharge home and just getting them out and meeting certain targets. Uh, but when they get home is when they really realize how much their life has been affected. So looking at the big picture for that person, looking at the, you know, the physical implications, the cognitive, as well as the psychosocial, and looking at how that um, impacts that person in their own environment and the, the different occupations that are important to them. So really, every client we see, we take that approach to look at all the pieces and figure out um, the unique picture for that client and how to... Uh, target treatment to help them get back to what they want to be getting back to. And we have a great team of OTs, all of who are passionate about neuro rehab in the community as well. Um, And all of who take on that really, um, you know, custom, we call it a custom brain-based approach to treatment. Um, So everyone takes that approach on in everything they do as they're working with their clients. It's amazing. Um, and what got you both into neuro rehabilitation? So for me, um, it just was always the brain was always really an area that I was interested in. Um, before I became an OT, I did you know, work in some other areas just to try and figure out what I wanted to do. So more, um, you know, orthopedic and soft tissue types of injuries. Uh, but really, I just kept going back to the brain being the area that I was really passionate about and interested in. It's just so unique and so amazing to see um, no client is the same and amazing to see, you know, what you can do through through treatment um, for these for these clients who feel you know, their lives have been really significantly impacted by their injury or diagnosis. Um, but to, to the brain, so amazing that, you know, the different approaches you can take to, to rehab someone. Yeah. And I used yeah. to. Yeah, I think for me, so I joined Complex Injury right out of um, graduating from my OT program. So it was my first job and I knew it was very much neuro rehab based and just based on my placements and working with clients. Um, from my placements and working with people with traumatic brain injuries, I always saw the big, right out of a TBI, the most important things that were being addressed was always the physical side of things. And that was always a priority for clients, for their families, even for the medical teams. And that, like Heather mentioned, that psychosocial piece, that cognitive piece was, wasn't often addressed at the very beginning. And I got to see through my placements the outcome of that and how much, because how much of that would be missed in the beginning, the repercussions of it and um, just all that time that was gone when when an OT could have gotten involved in the very beginning to address those components. So I knew with complex injury rehab, I would be able to get in there almost right away and dealing um, and working with clients right after a motor vehicle accident or workplace injury and really 
um, drive that message home of the importance of targeting other components, not just physical, and even just framing it to clients that way. Like you're going to a physio to strengthen these muscles and to get your range of motion back and to get that strength back in your muscles. The same way we're going to work the muscles in the brain and you know use that whole concept of neuroplasticity and um and that really worked for them i find like that message of treating your brain as you would um any limbs that you fractured or strained and going to physio you apply that same concept with um stimulating the brain yeah yeah both have a very holistic approach that really takes into account the client's environment and what is going on, not only internally, but also externally. Um, yeah. So going into that, um, so Heather, we met in, uh, in February, um, and then I think we probably had a few weeks or maybe you were seeing clients in person, but then you had to make a pretty quick switch to virtual therapy. Um, yeah. And for both of you, can you talk about your experience with the transition from providing um, remote uh, neuro rehabilitation focused occupational therapy and what you did to make that switch easier for your patients? Yeah, so of course it was um, a sudden impact yeah. and uh, caught everyone off guard, both you know us and our, our clients as well. Um, and actually, you know, I'm I'm always thankful of the timing when we met Dustin and we were able to get Happy Neuron up and running because it was an important part of our transition to virtual. Um, But I think, you know, another aspect of our practice is that we always try and be progressive and think outside the box. Um, We love incorporating technology. So the switch to virtual, I think we did um, really seamlessly um, as a team and, you know, really spent a lot of time educating our clients on how we were going to go about that and making them feel comfortable with that switch. We, of course, did a lot of research into the different uh, tele-rehab platforms and, you know, tried determining what's the most secure way that we can be doing that. Um, And actually, the transition did go well for a lot of our clients where we were able to get them set up on uh, tele-rehab remote video sessions with their occupational therapist. Um, and interestingly, some of our clients actually did better um, with that than when we were seeing them in home. It didn't, not obviously not everyone, some, it was more of a challenge, um, but it, you know, it, it really uh, worked well for people. It allowed us to continue with therapy in a time when, you know, if we'd had to stop altogether, uh, a few months later when we were able to go back in, I'm sure we would have been you know, really back closer to square one um, if we hadn't been able to continue with the, the tele-rehab. So I think it was, you know, we worked together as a team to figure out how we were going to do it, how we were going to feel comfortable, uh, what sorts of aspects of our treatment we could continue virtually, and then how to make our clients comfortable with that. And, you know, some of them, we needed to get them the technology to enable that. Um, but really, I was really impressed with um, how well we did as a team with making that transition to the virtual rehab. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What about you? What was your experience with the transition? Yeah, it was a bit of uh, it was a bit of a hit or miss for some clients. Um, so a big part of my caseload is also pediatrics. I work with a lot of kids post brain injury, post concussion. Um, so with them, it was a bit of a challenge. Um, in the beginning, it was fine just because the novelty of it they were excited to do virtual treatment and that just opened up opportunities to try new things that we hadn't done during in-person sessions but over time as the novelty wore off and they were all obviously getting fatigued with online learning as it was so I was doing like online schooling and then online therapy and it was just getting a bit too much so we did plateau a little bit there with um, at least with the kids on on my caseload but Other clients, um, like Heather said, I find responded better to virtual treatment just in terms of engagement and knowing that they didn't have to, you know, tidy up the place before I got there or uh, that stress was gone. And they were just, Um, I think, almost more compliant with virtual sessions versus in-person because there was less planning involved. 
Um, so in that sense, it works better for clients. In fact, I'm continuing to do virtual because yeah. those clients who just reported that and, it works better for them. And do you provide like predominantly individual services or do you do group therapy as well for your clients? Mostly we do individual services. So one-on-one -on -one in their home or, you know, we'll get them out in the community doing yeah. functional tasks like grocery shopping and riding the bus and things like that. Um, we do through the clinic, we um, have better potential to offer groups. So where, you know, we can have a space to, to host groups. Um, and actually another piece that's come with the, the virtual and, you know, here we're in Ontario where, you know, things are getting worse with respect to COVID. So, you know, looking at switching a bit more of people back to virtual, uh, we've been talking about hosting virtual groups um, for people. So now that more people are comfortable with the technology and, um, you know, it's going to be the longer this goes on, the tougher it is for people. So we're actually have a series of groups that we're doing for like small groups for people where it's a combination of support as well as education um so yeah so we get that we can't do it in clinic right now because of the restrictions so we're trying to shift that piece to do it online as well awesome and what kinds of goals do your clients have um both pediatric and adult um physical cognitive and mental health goals like what what do clients commonly tell you when they come to work with you um, so for me, a lot of clients, I end up seeing sometimes years post accident. Um, so a lot of the challenges that they're having are, have been long-term for a while and will potentially continue to be long-term. So they come to look for, you know, well, at first they come to ask if they're going to get better, right? Is my memory going to get better? Is my focus going to get better? And a lot of the time it becomes goals around, yeah, re remediating certain skills related to some of that cognitive functioning, but also helping them realize along the way that maybe there's just going to be a new normal with applying certain strategies. So a lot of our goals does become uh, education on compensatory strategies for their cognitive functioning and using that in their everyday life to create a new sense of normal of how they go about their day. Um, and then so from a mental health pers perspective, there's a lot of goals around stress management and implementing a lot of sort of relaxation strategies and routine throughout the day. So, you know, going back to the whole philosophy of occupational therapy and, you know, the idea of occupying your life with meaningful activities that are important for self-care for your productivity for leisure and so that hits kind of um that mental health perspective too with taking care of oneself and implementing those activities that uh, are good for stress management and, and managing your mental health and then just a lot of functional goals too right so with pediatrics a lot of um, goals related to return to school for the younger kids sometimes that means um uh, working on their handwriting, a lot of fine motor skills that they're having trouble with, or just uh, for the older kids as they get more homework and assignments and tests, working on their planning and their organization skills to keep track of everything. Yeah. Um, a lot of goals around advocacy, too, especially with, with the kids who are getting older and you know getting into high school and they need to learn how to advocate for themselves more. Um, and even just adults in the workplace, um, helping them work on those goals for advocating for accommodations. And obviously, we're there to help them along and provide, you know, the required documentation, all the formalities of it. But there is that everyday advocacy that's needed. And especially with kids, um, what about social skills and interacting with their peers and managing emotions and anger and communicating with their parents and their teachers and their friends, you know, I guess like what kinds of things do you work on to help intervene with that aspect? And then Heather, um, I'm going to ask you the same for adults too. Yeah. So with kids, um, a lot of the kids I'm currently working with, there's quite the team of work, uh, like other rehab professionals. So, there's a behavioral therapist involved or a social worker involved. So collaboration becomes a big part of their uh, their therapy. 
just so that there's consistency among all the rehab professionals in implementing those strategies and the skills in terms of their peer interactions and um, and those social skills like you were talking about. But a lot of um, those skills we'll try to get from the behavioral therapist and the social worker and you know make sure we're all communicating effectively so that every team member is implementing them during sessions but also consistently communicating with the parents with the teachers with everybody involved and what are those strategies that are working and how can we all be doing them to provide that sort of consistency it's really awesome yeah. for you and the people that you work with um I guess like the same thing and you're more geared towards adults. Yeah, yeah, yep. So I guess like how do you um like how do you work with your clients to work on, you know, those social skills and like anger management, which I know is a huge part of TBI rehabilitation. Um also the executive functioning just to help them, you know, not re injure themselves too. Yeah, and I think um a lot of the time, I mean, sometimes we start with people right from the beginning, but sometimes, you know, they've tried other things and they're not getting better. So by the time they've come to us, they're really frustrated and, you know, irritable with their family. They haven't been able to get back to work. And so, you know, they feel they can't contribute to their family and they worry about you know, financial worries and will I ever be able to get back to my job? Um, so it is a lot of education initially on the pieces that maybe haven't been addressed and similar to what Ayushi said in terms of the psychosocial aspects of working on anxiety and stress management um, is often a significant piece that we start with as well as sleep. Um, so kind of those, you know, if someone hasn't been sleeping well for a prolonged period of time, um, we can try and, you know, provide all the cognitive remediation exercises <laughs> we can, but if they're not sleeping well and they're constantly stressed and worried, they're not going to benefit from that as much as if we can manage their sleep and help them manage their stress and incorporate strategy um, for stress management into their daily life and incorporate a, a sleep routine and sleep hygiene strategies into their daily life. So then they can start to understand better the implications of their irritability or frustration or behaviors yeah. around them. Um, as well as just, yeah, use those strategies as part of their routine to help in the moment when they're feeling really frustrated and angry. Yeah. And um, so I know that you've been using our program for quite some time. Can you talk about maybe um, some of the exercises that you use um, with your clients and how they help them learn the strategies that they need to uh, practice those cognitive skills and also how that how you notice that um, cognitive training impacting them in their daily lives? Uh, yeah, so I have three clients who are actively using it. And by actively, I mean at least once or twice a week. I have one guy who does it pretty, re pretty religiously, like every morning, it's part of his routine now. And yeah. then I have another bulk of clients who can't really get into a routine with doing it on their own between sessions, which is what I would ideally like them to do. But so I just end up incorporating the exercises as part of um, some of our therapy sessions, especially with the kids. Uh, the kids, I use the exercises almost as like a warm up, um, just because they like they they like the game aspect of it. They're they're very competitive with themselves, so they like seeing their score, then they like beating their score. So I often use it as sometimes like a transition activity, sometimes it's just a warm-up activity at the beginning of our session. So that's with the kids. With the adults, um, I use it, well, one, for them to have some kind of routine built into their day. So it's something that they can be doing every day, every other day as part of their cognitive rehab. And the way I send that message to them in terms of why they need to be doing this is going back to the whole concept of neuroplasticity and, you know, working on those, the, like, just like how you'd be working on muscles and for a physio, you're, now you're working on building those neural pathways in your brain. And so this platform is one way of doing that. And then in session, uh, when I check in on them, 
I go through the progress together or we go through it together and we see, you know, where specifically are they making progress? Where have they kind of plateaued or where have they not been making as much progress? Why is that? Let's, you know, do this game together. And then I can kind of make my own sort of clinical judgments to see how they're actually going about. Uh, completing the task so I can see you know how fast are you reading through the instructions are they just kind of impulsively reading and not even getting all the detail are they even taking their time to uh, process the information and so those things I would miss because you know they're doing these activities outside of session um, or in their own time but then during therapy I can you know exactly see how they're going about it and what strategies they are using to help them perform and then we'll talk about it and you know see okay what could you have done to help you improve your score to help um you process the information a little bit better and then i'll also kind of in session when we're doing when we're going through the games um i'll play around with the parameters so i'll change up you know, how many attempts they get, I'll change up how much time they get for memorization, how much time they get to recall the information. Any parameters I can kind of play around with, we'll again, do the games uh, with those new parameters versus the old parameters. And then that becomes almost like a wake up call for them to see really how much progress they made when they just gave themselves an extra 20 seconds to look at the information. And then applying that to real life. So, okay, when you're going to, um, when you're going through your list of tasks to do for the day, or when your wife gave you this grocery list to go over, are you actually taking the time to process it? Or are you just kind of, you know, not taking that time? And look what happened when you did take that time when you did this game. So it's all about kind of, using the games as an opportunity to educate them on the session or the strategies and then again how they can apply yeah. that to their um, daily activities and heather what about for you what do you see with your clients and yeah so i think i would add to that i mean similar to what ayushi just said um i know some of our other team that uses happy neuron for example they might pick a certain memory or skill for the week so memory for example okay. um and they will use the Happy Neuron, the memory exercises within Happy Neuron specifically, um, work on those and also provide them education about memory and uh, pull in examples of how this, you know, the memory difficulties they're exhibiting might impact them day to day. And then the next week they might look at attention. So kind of building a program that way to gradually educate people on the different aspects of cognition um, and the other piece as well is a lot of our clients with concussion um, have a hard time looking at screens. So we will use the happy neuron to slowly build their tolerances for looking at screens. So like some purpose to looking at the screen and hopefully a bit of distraction as well because they become engaged in the activity, but using it to slowly build up their tolerance for completing activities on a screen uh, because yeah, for most people, it's the reality of daily life to be spending a significant yeah. the day looking at a screen. Yeah, it's uh, the reality of the working world, too. Mm -hmm. All right, so for both of you, now what I want to do is switch over to uh, your clinical expertise. Um, so can you take me through intake for discharge? What happens? With, what kind of assessments do you use to assess your clients? Uh, what goals do you identify and develop? Um, how do you carry out your therapy plan and then how you help and succeed after discharge? Sure. So as Rishi mentioned earlier, sometimes we sometimes we work with our clients for years. Um, so yeah, it can sometimes be quite a long process. Um, initially, uh, our assessment is very comprehensive, as we alluded to earlier. We're doing, we're looking at the physical, we're looking at the cognitive, and we're looking at the psychosocial, um, and and then obviously how that impacts functional activities within all aspects of their lives. Um, and I think we we spend a lot of time, and we're constantly reviewing how we're assessing, so that we're getting a, a good picture of of people. Um, the, the physical is fairly straightforward. 
Um, but I think what you know we like to really emphasize is those cognitive and psychosocial pieces. Um, and so from a cognitive perspective, we try and incorporate a lot of like, different tools so that we're looking at all the different aspects. Um, we, we found you know, several years ago that actually from an occupational therapy perspective, a lot of the tools weren't able to pick up on more mild to moderate levels of dysfunction. Um, so we actually created our own uh, tablet-based cognitive assessment to identify where there's challenges more in that mild to moderate range. So that's brain effects. So we use brain effects in our practice a lot to assess the functional cognitive aspect of things. And it pairs nicely with that neuron because then the brain effects assessment looks at the different aspects. So the different aspects of memory, the different aspects of attention, um, different executive functions, it, looks, it breaks everything down. So we can really see where there's strengths and where there's challenges. And then we actually will go, you know, be able to go back to a program like Happy Neuron and say, okay, they had these challenges with attention and here's the exercises to pair with that. Um, and, but then also really looking at the, the psychosocial piece. So, you know, doing questionnaires that assess uh, for symptoms of depression and symptoms of anxiety. Um, we talk about their social relationships and where there's challenges there. Um, and looking really comprehensively at, you know, their ability to do self-care, their productivity, which would be their work, their tasks around the home, their caregiving, and their leisure and social activities. So we're really seeing where they're finding they aren't able to engage like they were before their injury or accident or whatever that was. Um, anything you'd add to that, Aishi, and our assessment process? Uh, no, not so much assess, but yeah, it's basically looking at all the different components. Sometimes we, you know, we have to go through doing, you know, a visual assessment and seeing how maybe their vision has been affected, not just like 2020 acuity or, what, or whatever, right. but just or more of that, like that brain to eye connection and yeah. how that must have been impacted. Because that's a huge thing we also see. Yeah. Do you do like mm -hmm. eye tracking assessments to see like how their eyes go on the screen um, and just in their visual field in general? We'll often do um, like an assessment or a screening assessment like the VOMS um, to look at vestibular or visual ocular motor function. Um, we'll look at do like the MVPT to look at motor free visual perception test. Yep. Um, so yeah, different visual motor, visual perceptual activities as well as through the VOMS like saccades and visual ocular reflex. Yep. Mm -hmm. Just before we go, I just have a few more things I wanted to get into. Um, I noticed that complex injury, it seems like your practice is mostly uh, female and you are women owned and uh, predominantly operated. Do you have any advice for women that are interested in rehabilitation science? Yeah, so I think, I mean, a lot of occupational therapists are women. Um, so um, I'm not sure why that is, but that just has always been the way it is. Um, yeah. But I do think um, not a lot of occupational therapists have the courage to start their own practice. Um, so I think it's just, you know, being being courageous like that, giving it a try. If it's, you know, for us, it was something we were really passionate about and we couldn't see a way to, to work the way we wanted without doing it on our own. Um, so it's, you know, learning from other women in a similar position um, and not being afraid to, to take that step and try it out and just yeah, accessing all the resources you can to learn um, the pieces you don't know, the pieces you haven't learned in school. Um, and absolutely, I mean, I think it's, OT's always been, I guess, you know, female dominant profession. Um, but yeah, I think it's just- yeah. uh, I, feel, uh, I, feel like, I feel like occupational therapy, like in a way, um, just like calling you an OT, it's not like really fair because like, we want to call you like human engineers because you really do- <laughs> you know your clients really change their lives and really adapt um not only their behavior but just their environment and the the things that they use and really make their um their environment set up for success and i think that's just like something that is so important so amazing about occupational therapy um yeah, and i think just my like personal i'm always feeling like us as ot's we really need to be confident and in expressing the value in what we can do 
Um, still, there's a lot of people who don't know what an occupational therapist is, or they assume we just work <clears throat> on the work piece of things because we've got that word occupation yeah. in there. Um, so really, yeah, OTs is a profession, um, being confident and strong and understanding how valuable we are uh, in helping people with those functional real life yeah. activities. So can you both tell me what's your favorite thing about being an occupational therapist and also, you know, what an occupational therapist is according to you? Uh, yeah, so occupational therapy to me has always been, I always, the way I always describe it to people is, because I still want to incorporate that word occupation somehow, because like, like Heather said, I feel like that um, throws people off. So I always try to describe it as, you know, thinking, about uh, the activities that occupy your life, all the activities that you find meaningful, that you that could be pleasure, that uh, that you find productivity in. Um, think about all those activities that occupy your life, and then OTs come in when there's any sort of barrier that's preventing that person from engaging in that activity, whether it's an injury, it is some sort of disability. Uh, whether it's, you know, physical barriers, cognitive barriers, emotional barriers, and then OTs coming in to kind of break down those barriers by either working on the person or working with their environment or modifying the task, because the goal is always to return to those activities that clients find meaningful. And that's honestly, that's why I love being an OT. I remember Heather, there was a client you and I saw together very, very early on when I first started and I was shadowing you and the client, she was talking about a previous OT that she had. And she, she goes, I wouldn't even call her an OT. She was more of like my life manager because anytime she had an issue that she couldn't um, work at her desk or she couldn't focus, her OT would just figure out a way to make it work and figure out a way for her to participate in whatever she wanted to participate in. And it almost becomes like this, as Heather also mentioned, we a lot of our clients we've worked with for years. And a lot of that is because new goals come up and life happens and there's new occupations and new activities to to work on. And OTs just have a way of, you know, problem solving through those barriers and helping clients figure out how they can engage um, to their satisfaction and engage in a way again that they that they find meaningful. And it's just yeah, I like I like the term. I always go back to that story with, with that yeah. um, client saying that she had a life manager. <laughs> Heather, yeah. you, um, what's your favorite thing about being an OT, and what is occupational therapy according to you? So I think, um, yeah, yeah, I mean, I think Ayushi said that very well about OT, and I think my favorite part of being an OT really is just seeing, being able to progress people back to what they love doing. Often people think, I'm never going to get back to these things, and so just being able to see really slowly them getting back, and then all of a sudden they're like, oh my goodness, I'm doing this, and I never thought I'd get here, right? So. Um, yeah just being able to like it's just so functional and so meaningful for them to engage in these activities so that's really what i love about it is seeing that progress in really meaningful ways for them that's amazing um so if anybody if any occupational therapists or other therapists have any questions about um just some of the work you do and maybe like if they're looking for ideas is there um, a way to get in contact with you that you recommend for sure. I mean, I think the the best way is to email us and we're happy to, yeah, to share our passion and, and talk about whatever it is. Awesome. That, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, this has been great. Uh, thank you guys so much. And I really look forward to sharing this video um, on our website and also on our socials.